The Tavor 7 is IWI's most recent manifestation of its popular bullpup rifle, this time chambered in 7.62 NATO. For those unfamiliar, a bullpup rifle shrinks the dimension of a traditional rifle by moving the action behind the trigger mechanism. Among other things, this redistributes the balance characteristics, and in this case we end up with a rifle that weighs in at 9 pounds, with a 16.5 inch barrel that barely scrapes over the NFA safe limit at 26 and 3 quarters inches overall length. The rifle is constructed of a polymer reinforced skin wrapped around a chrome lined hammer forged quad groove 1 in 12 twist chrome molly vanadium barrel. The Tavor is a gas piston semi automatic rifle with a four position gas regulator, and more on that in a moment. All the controls on the rifle are ambidextrous or configurable to be ambidextrous. For instance, the dual ejector bolt can be rotated the ejector screen shifted, and the non-reciprocating charging handle switched to provide full wrong-handed operation should the end user require such consideration. Likewise, the bolt release is located in an advantageous position rearward of the magazine well for fast reloads when the bolt has locked open on the last round. For administrative purposes, the charging handle can also be used to lock the action open with an upward turn when retracted. The rifle ships with Magpul brand 20 round SR25 magazines, however, will readily accept standard metal construction magazines of the same specification. Hopping back to the front of the rifle, the barrel is threaded a 5 8 by 2 4 for seamless integration with all of your 30 caliber muzzle equipment, and it ships with IWI's proprietary brake that times with the use of a jam nut. This leaves the end user with plenty of extra thread for anybody looking to mount a suppressor, and the jam nut can also be used to time if you so choose. As previously mentioned, the rifle's regulator includes four settings. Regular, adverse, which we will come back to in a second, I promise, suppressed, and of course, off. We highly suggest that you use either the suppressor setting or the off setting when suppressing the rifle, as the ejection port location can make the port pop of the rifle quite loud. Just ask Bacon. <laughs> That was a mistake. Mistakes were made. <laughs> Ow. Ow. <laughs> okay. We're back. In lieu of the flimsy fold away iron sights present in previous iterations of the Tavor rifle, IWI decided to go with a full length Picatinny rail to accommodate both optics and the end user's choice of irons. Standard height sights should work just fine. Both sides of the rifle include two M-lock slots for accessory attachment, as well as a removable scale that reveals a second 1913 accessory rail under where your support hand would go. Other notable peripheral features that I think we should mention are interchangeable grips, integrated sling points, and a provision to lock and unlock the barrel should a barrel change be needed in the future. So before we go any farther, full disclosure, we've been working on this project for over a year across two guns. IWI approached us and asked us to do a test on preliminary imports to gauge market readiness of the DeVore 7. And while the firearm performed great from a reliability standpoint, we performed an exhaustive accuracy test and came up a little bit short on expectations. In doing so, we tried a plethora of ammunition from Fioki, the Aguila Monster, some Black Hills, Match Grade, and even some hand loads. We broke out two different lead sleds. I shot it from prone with way more optic than was necessary. And ultimately, we came up puzzled with our best group coming from Fioki 180 grain Sierra Match King. That is not what a 1 in 12 barrel should be optimized for. We would expect something around a 165, 170 range to be optimum, but we just weren't getting it. I even went as far as to capture some projectiles to ensure that they were properly engaging the rifling.
After reporting our findings to IWI US, they went back to Israel to try and work out the kinks. The second rifle, however, seemed to repeat the same performance. As of right now, we're going to report the accuracy at approximately 1.5 MOA. I typically like to see 308 guns come in at a minute or better. The only other idiosyncrasy that I can report that was present in both rifles is in the offsetting. Some makes of ammunition, particularly ball ammo, tends to be a bit sticky on extraction. Wombat really wanted to complain about it, but I just told him to put down the donuts and go to the gym. Can you man bear pig it? From here, we're gonna pick up from the range and we're gonna take a look at the adverse systems test. I promised you guys that we were gonna address that adverse setting later. And of course, some run and guns and some suppressor tests at night. Hits you right in the face if you do that. My poor microphones. <clears throat> that was fun. Bacon's here. We are going to do the adverse gas setting test. You know, so if you're like walking along the bank of the Jordan River or something like that, and you fall down in the mud or something like that, uh, that's what we're going to do today. So go ahead and flip it over to adverse. One gas position. Okay. Confirm that it is on adverse gas setting. Yep. Line there. Line there. Cool. Go ahead and function test it. Five rounds into the into the berm. Stir it up. <laughs> okay, nice and stirred up. Yes, indeed. Churning the bricks. Yes. Make it goopy again. That is some good Midwest slime right there. This gun has never seen anything like this. Test commence. <laughs> that has got to be the worst that that gun has ever seen. Nobody else did that. <laughs> I'm concerned. We might need a cleaning rod. You want to check the lug? Hey. <laughs> you might as well shoulder it now. Finish the magazine. Okay. Oh, check that out. It's steaming from all, it's burning off all the mud. Launcher. Let her breathe there for a second. I don't know if she needs to breathe. She Doesn't... might need to go back in deeper. <laughs> little seaweed, little. There it is, that's what we're looking for. Dredge the bottom with it. Make sure she's good to go. Oh yeah, I think it's ready to run. Look at that. Show everybody. That is perfect. Can you shoot the gun like that? Can you get to all the controls with that, with that wrap around it? Sounds like it piped. Did it run all 20? Locks open. What do you say there, boss? It's reliable. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you can argue with that. I my my AR-10 wouldn't do that. You know. Flippity floppity. Yeah, go get some liquid nail. How are you back. still so fat if you put all those miles on oh, them there, boots? Oh So when I think of a 308, I think of a couple different things. I think of uh, precision rifle shooting and then hunting things like that. 
Now, when I'm thinking about evaluating a firearm for a hunting capacity, I always think about what is the worst case scenario in which I'm gonna to have to discharge this gun. And if we critically think about that, I think that's at, the, at night. When it's pitch black outside, you can't really see very well. Maybe we're navigating by a, white, a small white light or maybe a little bit of night vision or something like that. And when you discharge a firearm in that environment, you blow out your night vision as well as also if you've got an appreciable amount of gas coming out of the gun, it can obscure your vision even more. Uh, it can mess, it can refract lights, uh, any tactical lights you got on or anything like that. And if, say for instance, you're coming out of the stand and a dangerous animal walks up on you, uh, like a wild boar or something like that, eh, you know, you might wanna know those things. So what we're gonna do right now is we're actually gonna wait a few more minutes till it's pitch black outside to conduct this test. You won't be able to really tell it on the monitor uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to get a baseline with a gun unsuppressed and we're going to throw the can on it and shoot it at each of the individual gas settings to see how the gun reacts with some standard ball ammunition. We're in the hole. Okay, you know. Woo! Real quick for the audience, I wanted them to see the equipment I'm working with here. Come down here. <laughs> you better get your magnifying glass out. The only other thing that I would say that I'd like to see them do is offer these magazine, or not magazine, uh, selector switches as, a, as a individually customizable. So you get a big one and you get a little one for the offside. The little one's for the offside so that when you wrap like this, it's not in the way. I would say that this is almost a little bit too easy to actuate and I found myself inadvertently turning it on uh, during the run. This is a Tavor, it's chambered in 308 and uh, it's kind of funky compared to what I'm used to working with. Yeah, we'll just see how it goes. I had a few rounds through it just to kind of familiarize myself with the controls. Uh, we'll see how embarrassing this ends up being. Well, I'm concerned that you're not going to make the reload because it's in a different spot. Uh, everything else is pretty much in the same spot as far as control-wise is concerned, so I don't think you'll have a problem there. Uh, I'm not so sure about that little man 308 recoil, though. Get him. You hit him. You got him. Got him? Yeah, you got him. All right, I didn't see him flop back. <laughs> that 308 recoil. Hit. Loading. Halfway done, halfway down. You got to put it in facing the right way. Oh, uh-oh. All right, let's start that over again. Pretend that didn't happen. You know, <laughs> the one bobble was the magazine. Yeah. Right, which wasn't a big deal. You just stayed your mag wrong. Well, the deal is we don't really wear a bunch of tactical operator operating and operational operations kind of stuff. If I had had a bunch of camo on, I think I would have went a lot better. I think it probably would have. Now, interesting to me was before you started this run, you said that you were probably going to go to the charging handle However, you didn't. It's true. You went for the release back here instead. What what was going through your mind? Well, I mean, normally, you know, if we compare it to an AR-15 that I'm most familiar with, I'm not an advocate of using the charging handle to charge that platform to charge a handgun. I use the slider release. I use the equipment on the gun that was designed for that purpose. And I wanted to see how it worked out. You know, I think the ergonomics on similar guns are, uh, you know, really tailored to make that process pretty easy. I wanted to see how this compared. And actually, it was pretty cool. I mean, you get the mag in it. There's a magnet. <laughs> I wonder why this weighed like 800 pounds. <laughs> I didn't intend to put rounds in this gun. Bacon in the house. 
closing out the Tavor 7 here. It shoots big bullets. <laughs> I'm just going to stick this in my back pocket. I really like my Wilder Tactical Belt. Um, they make 308 mag pouches, but uh, I don't have any. What is this thing and what does it do? Fight! <laughs> so much junk. <laughs> That was definitely not within the specifications of that target. <laughs> Is that bullpup so heavy that you can't hold it? <laughs> oh! <laughs> Somebody's fast. You got a little bump action going on there. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, thoughts on the Tavor 7? It's a Tavor. <laughs> Shoots big bullets. <laughs> big bullets. <laughs> Look at all the range dust. It is, uh, there is a lot to be said for 308. Yeah. Been this way so everybody can see. Got Am I gassed on my face? Yeah, you is got it. Sit on your face. <laughs> yeah, I was taking it. It's pretty rough. It farted on me. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what it ate, but it was kind of stinky. Must have been Italian. <laughs> Fiocchi.